afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And I will be talking about learning from those who've left your organization. <laughs> so almost all of you will be seeking jobs in the knowledge economy. And all of you know that you'll be moving from organization to organization over the course of your careers, more than your parents and even more than your grandparents. The typical view, the conventional wisdom about what happens when people move from one company to another comes from economists. It's the human capital perspective that, that Kent's been uh, invoking. And the idea here is that when Blue Man makes that move from your tech to their company, that Blue Man is carrying lots of knowledge and skills in his person. And when he moves from your tech to their company, that knowledge, those skills leave your company so your company loses and go to their company so their company gains. And the human capital perspective has been demonstrated by lots of researchers who've given evidence that new product ideas move to the companies who hire the people who've left, new strategies, technological developments, influence in different forms. So there's lots of evidence for this idea that Blue Man is carrying stuff away from your company into another company. Well, I'm here to provide an antidote to all this economics that you get all the time. I'd like you to take a sociological perspective and try a social capital perspective rather than a human capital perspective. So now, same situation, but imagine Blue Man is embedded in a network of relationships shown by those blue lines among all of his colleagues and friends in your company. When Blue Man makes his move, those connections become elongated like rubber bands so that Blue Man has the opportunity to talk back and reconnect with people in your company, even though he's left. And so now, even though the human capital perspective said everything was in Blue Man's head, the social capital perspective says, well, gee, if their company gains something and learns something about you, it might not be because it's already in Blue Man's head, but rather it might be because Blue Man is connecting back with his old friends and colleagues and learning more from them and from those relationships. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, come on now, Lori, there's non-competes, there's non-disclosure arrangements, this can't happen. Well, I am here to tell you there's lots of research that shows that these agreements are very difficult to enforce, and the courts are particularly <laughs> lax in enforcing them in regions like Silicon Valley. Those courts are among the most uh, uh, reluctant to prosecute those sorts of violations. So if we admit that Blue Man can have connections and take information from your company and bring it to their company, it's only a short step to also recognize that Blue Man's friends and colleagues in your company can also contact Blue Man and find out things about what's happening in their company as well, right? So the social capital perspective is really different from the human capital perspective because instead of the knowledge flowing in one direction, it's now going in a more symmetric fashion. So if the social connections are retained, knowledge can flow both ways. So what I do in my research is I try to make sense of whether this social capital perspective is actually operating. Now, you can't tell whether it's human or social capital when you look at how their company is learning, right? We don't know if it's in Blue Man's head or in the connections. So the twist that I make in my research is by looking at what happens to your company. Because if it's a human capital story, your company loses. But if it's a social capital story, your company can learn as well. So that's the question that I ask and I test. Do firms that lose employees actually manage to learn something from the firms that these employees subsequently join. How do we study this? I looked, along with a former doctoral student who's now an assistant prof at the University of Maryland, I looked at 150 firms in the semiconductor industry. There's a few of the members of our sample there. Over a 15-year period, and in order to make sense of who's moving and who's learning, we get this information from patent data. All right, so here's a test for you. This is a schematic from a patent of a famous guitarist who has a patent. Does anybody know? Venture a guess. What famous guitarist has a patent? Not listening to any music, just studying. All that human capital stuff. This is Eddie Van Halen. Okay, Eddie Van Halen has a patent that allows him to take his guitar and flip it horizontally, and it's propped up, if you can see, on some platform against his abdomen that allows him to see the entire face of the guitar and play with both hands freely. 
1985 patent. Here's how we get that sort of information about who's moving and who's learning from patents. Red box number one tells you the inventor. There's Eddie Van Halen on the patent. Eddie Van Halen happens to be self-employed. However, if he worked for a semiconductor company, right below it you'd see a box that says assignee, Cypress Semiconductor. And so we go through a database of 42,000 semiconductor patents, and we look for every patent from Eddie Van Halen. And if he always has patents they say Cypress, we say he's never moved. But if his patents for the first 10 years say Cypress, and for the next five years say IBM, we'll be able to infer that he moved from Cyprus to IBM. So we identify about 500 examples of people moving. Question number two, how do we know who's learning from whom? How knowledge is flowing between firms in the industry? That's box number two. Patents cite previous patents, just like a paper you write cites previous papers. So if we have a patent from Cyprus, we can see what citations it has, and we can tabulate how many times does Cyprus cite Micron, cite AMD, cite IBM, et cetera. So we can map all the knowledge flows in the industry and then see how much these mobility events affect those knowledge flows subsequently. And of course, when we do the statistics, we have to control for all sorts of other reasons why knowledge would flow. Do two firms have an alliance with each other? Have people previously moved? Are the firms in the same region? Are they similar technologically, et cetera? So we call control for all of those things, and what do we find? Lo and behold, we find evidence for this social capital perspective. Firms that lose employees are more likely to subsequently learn from the firms that they lose the employees to. But we can get a little bit more specific about this finding and figure out what's driving it. I split up my sample into two categories. When we have mobility events, two different types. Type one, you move to a firm in your same neighborhood. You just turn a different way when you leave your driveway, but you don't have to move to a new apartment, moving within the same geographic region. But type two, you move to a different region. So you have to uproot yourself, your home life, as well as moving to a different company. So let me test your intuition here. Of the 500 events in our sample, which do you think are more frequent? Show of hands, how many people think moving within the same region is more frequent? All right, about half. How many people think moving to a different region is more frequent? Not so much. It's like 50%, 25%, and 25% and undecided. Right? Well, your intuition is partly correct there. In our sample, it's five times more likely to move within the same geographic region than to move beyond. It's easier for people, and firms are concentrated in particular regions, like Silicon Valley. So moves there can be very frequent. Now let me test your intuition again. Which of these kinds of moves do you think leads to more learning? Okay, so it's not just are you moving, but does it lead to more learning? So type one, moving within the same region, the more frequent event. How many people think that leads to more learning? 25%. How many people think moving to a distant region leads to more learning? A little bit more. Your intuition is correct once again. In fact, the finding is dramatic. There is actually no effect within the same region. The entire aggregate finding is driven by the people who are moving to far away firms. And the reason why is that even though these moves within a region are so much more likely, people who move within a region are moving in a place that's already full of these network connections. People are already going to the same professional society meetings. Their kids are playing on the same softball fields and they're talking on the sidelines. There have already been a lot of moves between the firms. So one new move has very little marginal incremental benefit. In contrast, when you move from Silicon Valley to Boston Route 128 or to Taiwan or to Austin, Texas, there are far fewer connections, informal connections between the firms. That unique tie gives you the opportunity to create new knowledge flows and let non-redundant new knowledge happen between firms. So what's the big takeaway? Well, bottom line is, when you lose employees, you need to invite them back to the office. <laughs> Professional services firms know this, right? Consulting firms, legal firms, accounting firms have regular alumni get-togethers because they know that their alumni are working for clients, and that's a source of future business. But hopefully, as a result of research like mine, high-tech firms will also start to say there are these tremendous untapped sources 
of informal knowledge networks that can provide lots of good information to firms if they put some effort into harnessing them. Thank you very much. Thank you.